Hello and welcome. Uh, my name is Alexey Mahotkin, and uh, in this talk, I'm going to uh, tell you about minimal modeling. Uh, so I've been working with uh, databases for uh, more than 30 years already, uh, almost 30 years already. Uh, I started uh, working on uh, minimal modeling uh, maybe five years ago. I was uh, trying to kind of summarize what I uh, learned uh, in all those years, and uh, those are like uh, preliminary results. Uh, the topic of today's talk is uh, how to organize documentation for your uh, database. So uh, here is the plan of uh, presentation. Uh, so first, uh, we describe the problem as we have it now, as uh, many companies uh, have that. Then I'll do a brief crash course on uh, minimal modeling. Uh, then uh, we will talk about the processes around the, uh, the catalog. And uh, finally, I'm going to tell you about the uh, early adopters experience with uh, minimal modeling. So a uh, few years ago, I saw a post on Reddit uh, that was titled something like 240 tables and no documentation. Uh, and the person who wrote this post was asking for uh, some advice on what to do. Uh, and this is a completely typical situation. It happens in uh, many uh, corporate databases. And the only thing that uh, that uh, is different is probably just the number of tables, basically. And this number is uh, often much, much higher. Uh, why do we care? So imagine that you're the new employee joining some company. You're a data scientist or something like that. So somebody whose job is to uh, write queries and analyze data. What happens on your very first day? You probably go through some sort of uh, usual onboarding procedure. Uh, you have welcome session, uh, you receive laptop, passwords, access rights, some starting URLs and so on. Then you read uh, some uh, onboarding wiki pages, uh, there are links to other documentation, some intranet pages, internal tools, and so on. On the following day, you probably receive your first Jira ticket. Uh, at, this, at this moment, uh, nobody expects that you're going to, be, to become productive immediately. But uh, still we have uh, a question. Uh, how do people get up to speed with, uh, with data, with database? Um, you're probably uh, supposed to read some documentation, run some test queries. Uh, you read uh, code written by other people and you ask questions. Uh, you spend several days on all of that. And uh, uh, finally, you can uh, mark the Jira ticket as a ready for review. Uh, people will review your uh, uh, request, uh, merge request. Uh, they will uh, give some feedback, uh, ask you to do some changes, suggest better ways, and, uh, and so on. You're going to do some follow-up fixes. This is going to take a bit more time, maybe a couple of days. Uh, and finally, uh, you, your first uh, result is, uh, uh, your first ticket is uh, done. Uh, those days uh, the, uh, that you spent, they cost money to the company. You're basically paid to extract the knowledge from the uh, company knowledge base. Uh, every uh, company has uh, some sort of knowledge base. Sometimes 
this knowledge base is like literally go talk to AJ and ask any questions. Uh, is this really the most uh, efficient way to extract this knowledge? Uh, if we uh, talk about money, can we uh, cut the number of days in half? Uh, for that, we need to take a closer look at what exactly happens uh, while you learn the database. Uh, then we can uh, determine the uh, sources of friction. Uh, in other words, uh, what hinders the velocity of uh, your work. Uh, during that time, you do uh, lots of like usual things. You talk to people, you read code, you uh, read documentation, uh, run some uh, test queries, uh, and the browse database schema. And uh, there are lots of different sources of friction here. Uh, for example, it's not really clear uh, where to begin reading the database schema. Uh, usually there are some sort of uh, like uh, uh, common tables uh, such as users and orders, but uh, beyond that, things uh, get messy pretty quickly. Uh, second source of uh, friction is that uh, most uh, wiki pages are out of date, missing, incomplete, uh, obsolete, and so on. And same uh, goes uh, for the data catalog. Uh, and here I am talking about the uh, usual approach to that, the uh, solutions that uh, work directly with tables and uh, columns. Uh, this, is a, this approach is a very common approach, and this is basically the key point where uh, minimal modeling uh, does uh, things uh, differently. Uh, in a few minutes, we'll discuss how. Uh, lots of uh, company knowledge uh, is accumulated in the heads of people. You can uh, talk to those people and they'll tell you everything you need to know. But the problem is that those, those people are usually busy. So you can schedule the a knowledge transfer meeting right away. You have to meet for uh, to, to wait for a couple of days. This is also a source of friction, and this is also a reason why the time to uh, time to the to first results uh, is longer than it could be. Uh, while you wait, you can read existing code, but uh, when you read any code, uh, you always have this uh, important question in mind. Like, uh, do we really want to have more code like this? Uh, is this still the right approach? Uh, maybe there are, uh, maybe some of the data sources are, uh, uh, are uh, uh, deprecated. Maybe there are better ways to do that. Uh, and it's never clear from the code. So, because maybe it was written years ago, uh, and uh, there is always a risk to copy paste something and basically propagate the cargo cult. So, uh, what does uh, minimal modeling add to this picture? Uh, let's take a toy e-commerce system and see how we can uh, begin documenting that. So here is a typical example database schema. Uh, only the number of tables is going to be like at least 20 times as much. And uh, 
uh, traditional uh, methods would uh, tell you to go over each table and each field and uh, try to describe uh, what is stored in them. Uh, minimal modeling takes a different approach. Uh, so here is the main idea. Uh, every database can be represented by uh, four uh, things, uh, four lists, list of anchors, list of attributes, list of links, and list of secondary data. There is nothing uh, except for those four things. Uh, this approach uh, covers uh, every database that I can imagine, that I could find. Uh, this applies to traditional relational databases, to NoSQL designs. It also works for uh, data warehouses and also for the primary backend data, the data where you actually record the transactions that happen in your system, on your website, whatever. It, uh, it even uh, works with uh, such things like uh, Amazon S3 and for blockchain, to name a few. Um, so here is the first uh, list, the first like catalog of anchors that it makes sense to begin with anchors because everything is based on them. Anchors are nouns and uh, uh, they are traditionally known as entities. And uh, uh, here are three uh, example uh, anchors, customer, item, uh, campaign. Uh, and in the second column of this table, we can write down where you can find the IDs of those anchors. You can use either the simple format like table.field or for more complicated cases, you may want to use uh, SQL query, select ID from campaigns. Uh, the idea of anchors was, uh, of course, borrowed from uh, anchor modeling, uh, high Lars. Uh, and uh, um, uh, so, uh, um, so mm, this is the uh, the second list, the catalog of attributes. Uh, attributes store the actual data, and here are three uh, examples. Uh, so let's uh, take a look at each of the column in this more uh, like a bit wider table. So the first column is uh, basically a short name for the for, uh, for the attribute. So for example, customer underscore underscore registration date. This is basically a machine machine readable name, a uh, unique name for the attribute that you can use uh, to refer to this attribute in writing, in other texts, in uh, source code, in uh, other documentation, and so on. So this is how you find this uh, this attribute in the in the in the catalog, right? The second column is uh, uh, the anchor that this uh, attribute uh, belongs to. Uh, then we have uh, uh, some uh, um, SQL query or just the column definition of where this, uh, where the actual data is stored. So for each uh, anchor ID, we want to know what is the value of this attribute. Uh, so uh, again, for some uh, for complicated cases, you can use uh, SQL query. For uh, trivial cases, you can just use uh, uh, table dot field or something like that. Uh, so it's uh, supposed to be uh, readable and understandable by people. This is not 
uh, yet a like a machine readable thing. Uh, the last column uh, actually describes what uh, the nature of the data is. And uh, here we use uh, questions. So usually when you talk to people, uh, you can uh, you will say something like uh, item price, which is very natural thing to say. But here we use a slightly formalized uh, question. And so we say, what is the price of an item? Is this campaign active? And so on. Uh, why do we use questions? Because it helps to precisely define uh, more uh, uh, more complicated cases. For trivial cases, it looks like a bit of overkill, but actually it uh, so it, it for uh, uh, to be uniform, we use questions everywhere. And also, uh, asking questions helps with the database design. So this uh, using questions uh, for this purpose is, I think, one of the like uh, innovations of uh, uh, minimal modeling. Um, so now I'd like to talk about uh, tooling a little bit. So uh, minimal modeling catalog is basically three or four uh, spreadsheets. So you can use any tool that supports tabular format. You can use Google Docs, Google Sheets, Notion, Greased, uh, Markdown, uh, whatever. When you decide uh, when when you decide when you when you decide to be more serious about this, you can consider writing uh, some sort of a custom tool uh, that uh, closely integrates with your your environment. Uh, at the moment, there is no official tooling, unfortunately, and the reason for that is because there are so many uh, database implementations and so many environments. So uh, basically even uh, connecting to any database is, is sometimes a very difficult thing to do. And uh, it's uh, just going to be a big uh, barrier to entry. So there is no tooling. But there are some ideas about a plausible MVP uh, for this tooling that kind of like uh, would allow you to uh, integrate with uh, different uh, environments. Uh, we really want the catalog to be collaborative. Uh, we want as many people as possible to uh, contribute to the catalog we need to remove uh, barriers to uh, to entry as much as possible. Uh, basically, anyone needs to be able to open the tool and add a couple of records to the catalog. I'm not even saying about reading the catalog. I'm talking about uh, contributing to the catalog. Uh, now, uh, back to the uh, to the catalog. And here we have a list of links. Links connect uh, two anchors. Uh, and uh, uh, links uh, are described by the sentence uh, that uh, mentions both uh, anchors. So uh, here, for example, we have customer placed an order. It connects two anchors, customer and order. And uh, the sentence you can also look at that at, at, at the sentence from a different from the other side, and it's never clear which side is actually like better. So you just choose one. So you can also say order was was placed by a customer. Maybe you're uh, uh, in the uh, 
like a department that is more interested in orders and not in customers. Uh, links are also described by uh, SQL queries. So here you have uh, select user ID, order ID from orders. That is, you need to uh, provide such a query that would re return uh, all the pairs of, uh, cust of customer IDs and order IDs. Uh, the SQL query is uh, mostly for people. It can be not even the SQL query. It can be like a pseudocode or a, I don't know, for complicated cases again. But of course, if you have a, a query, this query snippet, uh, people can copy paste that snippet and use it in their own uh, in, in their own queries. Um, the the catalog uh, accumulates because our tool is uh, collaborative. Uh, anyone can add uh, records to the catalog. So if you add only uh, 10 uh, links or attributes uh, every week, in a year you're going to have 500 records in your, in your catalog. So you, you will have 500 nouns, sentences, questions, sample queries, information about the data type, uh, ownership data, and so on and so on. Uh, so back to the catalog of links. We added uh, two more links. Order includes an item and customer converted from campaign. Um, so note uh, those uh, small ellipses at the right side of the table. Uh, you can add any additional columns to this catalog. For example, you can add the data ownership information. So we added the column uh, called owner team and we started filling in this uh, information, which team is responsible for uh, each piece of data. So the catalog is extensible in two, 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 two dimensions. And uh, of course, this is also true for attributes and for anchors. Um, uh, the last uh, list uh, uh, of uh, minimal modeling catalog is uh, secondary data. So anchors, attributes and uh, links are primary data. Uh, if you lose any data contained there, then you have to restore, restore, restore from the backups. Everything else is secondary data. It can be uh, regenerated from the primary data. Uh, so, for example, uh, you can have a classic uh, aggregated table sales volume per day, which is kept up to date by some code uh, running somewhere. You can also have uh, like this column uh, orders count that contains uh, the number of orders made by, by the customer. Uh, you can get the same information by just querying the orders table directly, right? But uh, very often people introduce this sort of uh, uh, caching uh, caching columns for uh, for speed basically for convenience and this uh, column is uh, uh, um, is, is kept uh, uh, kept updated like for example by database trigger uh, so uh, there are many different types of uh, secondary data uh, for example, the machine learning models, if you look at them from the right angle, uh, are also secondary data in terms of minimal modeling. Uh, this is a topic for a different uh, talk. So let's check. We have a 
an excerpt of a, a database schema on the right. And we can see that every column can be classified as either uh, anchor or attribute or link or a secondary data. Uh, so uh, the minimal modeling uh, catalog is a deliverable. It's an uh, artifact, it's a document, right? But uh, let's uh, take a look at the uh, process processes behind this deliverable. Uh, basically, the idea is that if you learn something new about the data, about the database, you add a record to the catalog. That's it. Anyone can do that. Just add an attribute, a link or an anchor. Uh, as we saw, each catalog entry is uh, like uh, just a handful of columns. Like in practice, it's going to be five to eight columns. Uh, and the tables are designed to remove most of the barriers to entry. So um, like the names of the, uh, the uh, columns are very straightforward. Like for most of them, you don't even need to, to think a lot like the most uh, difficult part is probably writing the sentence or a question or choosing a noun is also very difficult. So uh, it should take like uh, five minutes to add uh, uh, to add uh, to add the record. And uh, so yeah, but for that of course you have to you have to have a shared document and uh, editing rights for that, which is the idea. So when you see a mistake in the uh, data catalog, you can just fix it. Uh, minimal modeling really encourages uh, like drive by contributions. So the common scenario is that like you read some documentation, any documentation, and you find out that there are a couple of places that are uh, incorrect and you know that. So what do you do? How do you fix it? Sometimes it's uh, it it uh, it would be a bit of a process to submit this fix. Uh, so like wiki was created, of course, to make it more uh, easy, but uh, this is not uh, there are some other problems uh, with wikis. And uh, I believe that uh, minimal modeling catalog uh, just strikes this balance where you can actually fix a mistake and uh, proceed with your day. So you don't need any, um, I don't know, approval for that. So now we can, uh, like g going back to the discussion of onboarding. Uh, so, of course, my suggestion is that uh, you can make uh, reading minimal modeling catalog as part of the onboarding process for the new uh, for new people. Onboarding both in the company and on the project. Uh, also, you during the during the the onboarding, you can also learn how to. Uh, how to contribute and you're also like you're also told that you're expected to contribute. Uh, for example, you can add uh, into your definition of done uh, for the ticket. You, uh, you can say that uh, uh, as part of work on the ticket, uh, you're supposed to uh, add any missing to document any missing uh, attributes and links that you had to use or to learn during work on this ticket. And uh, this, of course, uh, brings the question, like, wouldn't it be a source of uh, friction by itself? Um, I believe not so much because the catalog record is so simple, but yeah. 
Um, in the catalog, uh, nouns, sentences, and uh, questions are used to describe the pieces of data. And this means that uh, people can use a common vocabulary from the very beginning. So if you use uh, business domain terms in those uh, sentences, you can talk to uh, business uh, stakeholders using their language. So in the examples that we just discussed in those tables, we used uh, the word uh, customers, but uh, the table is actually named users, but we used the word customers because it's closer to the business reality. And the name of the table is just like an implementation artifact, implementation detail. So the theory is that as a result of improved onboarding, uh, we can reduce the number of days needed to achieve the, to get to the ticket is done. And uh, like uh, a few slides later, I'm going to show you the uh, real, world, uh, real world example of that. So <clears throat> when you listen to what to what people are saying about data catalogs, one thing is clear. You need to have a lot of organizational alignment, uh, a lot of effort, and you get a lot of friction and resistance along the way when you are introducing a data catalog. But what if you cannot even um, <clears throat> think about introducing a data catalog because you're just not senior enough at the moment. One scenario that I find uh, plausible is that you can use uh, minimal modeling as your personal knowledge base. So suppose you're, you join a new company, you go through onboarding, you work on tickets. You can just dump uh, everything that you learn in uh, your own private document. You don't even need to share that with, with anyone initially. You describe, you describe the data in uh, terms of uh, anchors, links, and uh, attributes. Uh, then at some point, uh, you can maybe share the relevant parts, uh, subset of that, when you discuss some some new thing uh, or the thing that you did with your teammates or with other people. Uh, then you can share this document with people and uh, maybe you will even get your first contributor and so on and so on. And maybe this thing will even begin to get some uh, some some traction. So I think that this could kind of maybe it could be someone's like personal leverage. I don't know. So um, this is the final section of my talk. And uh, I'd like to tell you about uh, some uh, results that the early adopters of uh, minimal modeling reported. Uh, so my friends at epoch8.co basically went all in with minimal modeling. Uh, Epoch 8 is the data analytics and uh, machine learning agency. They have uh, multiple clients and uh, now all their work, all their project work is based on uh, minimal modeling. So first thing that they do at the start of a new project is they build a minimal model. They use it uh, not only for documentation, but also to design the uh, data layer. So first thing that happened is that uh, for them, uh, project onboarding went down from around one week to less than a day. So any team member can pick up uh, any ticket for unfamiliar project within a day because everyone knows where, where, is the, where the catalog is, 
what it contains, it's easy to read, and so on. Uh, second is that it's now much easier to hire people. You basically have less requirements for the qualifications. Uh, so when new people join, join the company, they receive uh, a training, like a few hours, somebody explains to them uh, uh, not only minimal modeling, but also how it's implemented in the company, where things are and uh, what the tools. They use Grist, by the way. <clears throat> and that's mostly it. So after that, they can uh, immediately begin working on uh, any project. So as the result, it was told that uh, they had a substantial uh, bottom line improvement because basically for the same uh, project budget, uh, you need less salary to, 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 to pay for the time that it takes to find out how the project uh, is, uh, how the project works. So more profit. And uh, finally, finally, uh -huh, finally, it's now easier for them to close sales because during the pre-sell call, uh, potential clients can see how the documentation looks and how the uh, uh, and how the data is organized. So they sometimes can literally begin uh, modeling the uh, new uh, the uh, the client's data, like sharing the screen on the call, and they can talk with uh, business people about the the business, right? Um, so this is uh, the last page. Here we are. Uh, if you think that this is something interesting, uh, please drop me an email and we can talk. We can discuss. I am super interested to see how uh, minimal modeling uh, could be applied in different uh, situations. Uh, in uh, different uh, environments. Uh, you can see that I am uh, very serious about this topic because I even have a teacup with anchors on that. Also, I invite you to subscribe to my Substack. Uh, that's it. Now is the time for questions if you have any.